the great Canadian wrestler, the prophet, one might say, of Canadian professional wrestling. So, Jeremy, th this is actually, I hope that you will do the most of the talking or else you have to. I, I, I've seen some interviews with you and you are, you're not that, um, what can you say, fond of uh, a closed mouth. <laughs> you have a lot of words, but for me, I want to tell your story. So it's up to you what you want the listeners to know about you. So my catchphrase, or what can you say, is that every wrestler has a story to tell. So who is Jeremy Prophet? Well, before enlightening the audience as to who Jeremy Prophet is, I want to I want to first thank you, Nikolai, for having me here on your wonderful show. Um, always glad to get to share my experiences in the great world of professional wrestling with a new audience, uh, especially one that comes from a different part of the world. Uh, so that's definitely a blessing, and I, I thank you very much for that. Um, in wanting to know who Jeremy Prophet is. Um, I mean, when it comes down to it, Jeremy Prophet is, is the story of perseverance, the story of somebody who is aggressively passionate and believes in themselves and what they hope to accomplish in the wrestling business. Um, mm -hmm. I don't compare myself to anyone because everyone's journey is different uh, as mine has been. And so when it comes down to it, I'm just somebody who knows that I'm on the cusp of greatness and I will attain that one day. And people are going to get to look back on episodes like this on the many podcasts I've been on and say, wow, yeah, I saw him there. And, you know, now he's a world champion. Now he's somebody that realistically should have had his moment in the sun uh, many, many years ago, but unfortunately has gone unnoticed like a diamond in the rough that's sometimes a little bit hard to see. Uh, so to put that into specifics, I mean, my journey started back in 2003. That's when I first started training at oh. Jacques Rougeau's wrestling school. Ah, and that is Jacques Rousseau. I know him, the Mountie. Yes. 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 Yeah, yeah. Elected I'm an old guy. Intercontinental champion, tag team champion, multiple times. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, oh, sorry. Sorry that I interrupted you. Please continue. That's okay. You only get one of those in a Jeremy Prophet interview. So you got your free pass now. The oh, rest is on no. no, no, no Jeremy. Just... Sorry. Can, can I get two oh, more? Good. Two more, please. Mm -hmm. All good. You know what? It's your okay. show. I'm willing to play by your rules. So anytime, uh, okay. anytime you want to jump in and cut me off, because like you told your audience. Welcome, Jeremy Prophet, to the Danish Wrestling Nerds YouTube channel. And this will also be a recording for the podcast. And I will say it in Danish, so probably most of the listeners can understand. Uh, Restland on Earth. But let's get back to what this is all about. The great Canadian wrestler, the prophet, one might say, of Canadian professional wrestling. So, Jeremy, th this is actually, I hope that you will do the most of the talking or else you have to. I, I, I've seen some interviews with you and you are, you're not that, um, what can you say? fond of uh, a closed mouth <laughs> you have a lot of words but for me i want to tell your story so it's up to you what you want the listeners to know about you so my catchphrase or what can you say is that every wrestler has a story to tell so who is jeremy prophet well, before enlightening the audience as to who Jeremy Prophet is, I want to I want to first thank you, Nikolai, for having me here on your wonderful show. Um, always glad to get to share my experiences in the great world of professional wrestling with a new audience, uh, especially one that comes from a different part of the world. Uh, so that's definitely a blessing, and I, I thank you very much for that. Um, in wanting to know who Jeremy Prophet is. Um, I mean, when it comes down to it, Jeremy Prophet is, is the story of perseverance, the story of somebody who is aggressively passionate and believes in themselves and what they hope to accomplish in the wrestling business. Um, I don't compare myself to anyone because everyone's journey is different uh, as mine has been. And so when it comes down to it, I'm just somebody 
who knows that I'm on the cusp of greatness and I will attain that one day. And people are going to get to look back on episodes like this on the many podcasts I've been on and say, wow, yeah, I saw him there. And, you know, now he's a world champion. Now he's somebody that realistically should have had his moment in the sun uh, many, many years ago, but unfortunately has gone unnoticed like a diamond in the rough that's sometimes a little bit hard to see. Uh, so to put that into specifics, I mean, my journey started back in 2003. That's when I first started training at oh. Jacques Rougeau's wrestling school. Ah, and that is Jacques Rougeau. I know him, the Mountie. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm an old guy. Intercontinental champion, tag team champion multiple times. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, oh, sorry. Sorry that I interrupted you. Please continue. Yeah. That's okay. You only get one of those in a Jeremy Prophet interview. So you got your free pass now. The oh, rest is on no. The no, no I'm Jeremy. Good. Sorry. Can can I get two more? Two more, please. All, all good. You know what? It's your okay. show. I'm going to play by your rules. So anytime, uh, okay. anytime you want to jump in and cut me off, because like you told your audience, I am a little long-winded. I like yeah. talking a lot. It's why the promoters uh, pay me the big bucks, although it's not as much big bucks as I'd like to be making. Um, you know, it's one of the things that I bring to the table is I'm never at a loss for words. But but so, please, I want to have that wind mouth all the time. So uh, as I was saying, started yeah. with Jacques Rougeau. You know, we, we know his credentials, accomplished a lot, multiple yeah. time tag team champion, intercontinental champion. I wanted to be trained by the best. And so I was actually thinking originally of going out west and training with the hearts. Uh, you know, I, I was the only school we knew of in Canada. And um, then I discovered Jacques Rougeau's wrestling school, and I heard he was training younger students, people my age. I started training. I was about uh, like 17, 16 or 17 years old. I had just finished high school. So that's why I said, you know what, that might be a good fit for me because I'll be surrounded by other students around the same age. Um, I was fortunate that I had a good friend of mine, one of my best friends. Uh, his younger brother had started training with Jacques. And then we were having just, you know, the graduation ceremony and we were all there together. And he said, you know, maybe you should come give this a try. I know you're a big wrestling fan. Everyone in school knew I was the, the biggest wrestling fan. <laughs> and so I said, for sure. I mean, I knew I was going to do this. It's like literally in my high school yearbook that, you know, I was going to be a champion in wrestling because I knew I was going to find a way into this because the only thing I wanted to do with my life. Um, I'm, I'm very passionate about professional wrestling. I want to make my living doing professional wrestling. I want to be a champion and I, I will accept nothing less because for me, it's not a side hobby. It's not a, I'm just happy to be here and participate. It's like, no, I want to win. I want to be successful. I want to be a standard in professional wrestling that people need to be able to be on the level of Jeremy Prophet. And I don't speak from a place of cockiness. I don't try to sell people on things I can't deliver on. You know, you watch me perform and you'll see the abilities yeah. I bring to the table. And I always say, I have yet to meet my equal. And don't think just because someone's on TV and they've been handed championships that that means they're better than me. Uh, because quite frankly, I've yet to meet someone who looks as good as I do, who talks as well as I do, and does the thing that's actually the most important, which is wrestle as well as I do and as diversely as I do. So I've yet to meet someone who can do all these things. I've seen people who can do one or two. I've seen people who can do maybe one or two better than me but I get to see someone who can do them all as good or better than me. So if you want to know who Jeremy Prophet is, my body of work speaks for itself. You know, hell, my body speaks for itself. But when yeah. it comes down to it, you can scrutinize me under any kind of a microscope and you'll see I stand the test of time. Why I've not been picked up by a major company as of now, I think that more speaks to the lack of scouting in professional wrestling because I think I could make a tremendous amount of revenue for any of the top companies anywhere in the world. So it, it's not a matter of if, it's really a matter of when, because like the saying says, you can't keep a good man down, the cream rises to the top. And I know that my time will come, whether it comes organically or whether I have to push the envelope and just be my aggressive, outspoken, controversial self to get people to pay attention. One way or another, you're gonna be hearing about Jeremy Prophet for years and years to come. You know, they're going to do the documentary story on my life, and maybe they'll be using footage from this interview. I say it yeah. in all of them because I speak it into existence, <laughs> and I'm sure it's going to happen. Yeah, I, I think so too. But Jeremy, one thing yeah. that I really love about this and the way that your expression and so on, I could actually see a whole lot of wrestlers, maybe 99% of the wrestlers 
that could just learn from just seeing the first five minutes of this interview because I've seen so damn shitty promos in wrestling. Yeah. Just, hey, to, well, just to be a little bit modest, not to, to boost your uh, self-confidence, but damn, you're good, Jeremy. Well, well, thank you. I mean, this, this is Jeremy Prophet 24 hours a day. Uh, for the longest time, I, I tried to fit the mold. You know, you get a lot of wrestling school. You got you to gotta fall in line. You got to keep your head down. You got to be humble. But, but to be fair, that, 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 that didn't really get me as far as I would be. So in case of noise, it's a case of being controversial, making sure people are going to pay attention and, you know, making sure you're going to get yourself to the place that you want to be. You got to speak it into existence. You got to believe it. I have no insecurity about anything in my professional wrestling game. You put a live mic in front of me. You tell me you need me on a plane to go to Japan tomorrow. You need me at, at TV for whatever event. I'm ready to do it. I, I'm ready yesterday. And I always say that. I don't got to go and, and tan myself and, and pump myself up and uh, you know, <laughs> no. practice in front of a mirror. And all. I've done that, man. I've been doing this for 16 years. Yeah. 16 years. Going to be 17 next month. Whoa. 17 years in the business. And on top of that, I, I've never even had an injury. Like, there is no chink in my armor, man. I, I've not been, I've not missed a day of work for anything. I've always been 100% healthy. No surgeries, no broken bones, no concussions. This brain works 100% intact. Probably why my promos are a lot better than those other crumb bums that you've seen uh, doing horrible promos yeah. out there. I think uh, they, I think some of the brain cells might have uh, magically disappeared. Yeah, well, one I could say, about that. No, I ain't one could about say, that my brain. <laughs> one could say probably uh, the wizard of uh, professional wrestling or what he likes to call himself at the moment he has been around um, magically um, put them away in the magic realm but uh, Jeremy let's go back to uh, one thing that I'm very interested in it is your first steps in professional wrestling when you started at wrestling school take us all back to where it all started. Your first baby steps towards a professional wrestling ring. So, like I was saying, there was a good friend of mine, his younger brother had started training with Jacques Rougeau, had probably been doing it for about a year, invited me to go there. So I jumped in head first right away. I assumed, you know, I was going to get in there, probably not even get in the ring, maybe just, you know, listen to some of the fundamentals and the, the, the real rudiments of professional wrestling, not get a chance to really cut my teeth on it. Uh, but to my surprise, on the first day, they invited us in the ring. There was myself, and I think there was maybe one other new student who had shown up that day. And then they put us in the beginners group, which had started, I believe, uh, a week or two before that. So they had a two-week advance on us. Um, threw us right in there. First thing they taught us was how to circle, then how to lock up, and then they allowed us to take some bumps. And that's what I was really looking forward to because, you know, I had, <laughs> yeah. I, I had seen tough enough. And I saw how, like, when these uh, people that they brought in for Tough Enough took their first bumps, it really just knocked the wind out of them. And then, you know, some of them you could see in their face right away. They wanted to just throw in the towel right away. Yeah. Um, so I was excited to bump. That was the first thing. So right away, they, they told us the techniques. They said, you know, you got to tuck your chin, spread your arms out, and brace for impact. I went down, took that first bump. I was expecting it to be the most painful thing in the world. And I did it. <laughs> I did it in a yeah. ring that many here will consider the stiffest ring in our entire province, if not the <laughs> entire country. Probably not the entire country. I've been around and found a few that would give it a run for its money. But <laughs> definitely, I would say stiffest ring in our province. I didn't yeah. know at the time. It was all I was used to. It's why now I don't mind bumping in any of the rings here, because <laughs> that one that I started in, that was that was practically like bumping on, on, on cement. So okay. Whoa. I took that first bump. and. I was okay. It was fine. And then like, you know, I remember the trainers, like they looked at me, uh, not Jock, but the guys that he had instructing us. They're like, wow, this one, you know, this one's a natural, you know, he took that first bump uh, just as well as anybody here. You know, you're going to be good kid. And, um, you know, then after that, it was just consistent training one or two times a week, uh, different instructors, Jock himself sometimes. And, uh, and I loved it. I loved every moment of it. I, I I'm a person who uh, doesn't particularly enjoy getting up at the uh, absolute crack of dawn, but uh, <laughs> classes were early morning in uh, very cold winter Quebec, Canada. Ah. So uh, while it was not the most ideal conditions to be 
out and about on the road, making the long drive, and then putting your body through some abuse. Uh, I loved it. I, I, I would stay, I, I would be maybe not the first one there, but I would definitely uh, be in the first couple of ones there, but I'd always be the last one to leave. I, I would not want to leave there. I would want to be in there after class was over, trying different things, hitting the ropes, getting up on the top rope, jumping down onto the crash mats, uh, working on different maneuvers. Uh, that, that's what it was like for me. I was always the last one to leave. I was the one locking up. Uh, I was the one that you could not pull away from there because that was all I wanted to do. And, and a footnote on that too, is yeah. that, and not a lot of people know this. I don't know if I've ever said this in any interviews, oh. um, but I, I've been an athlete my whole life. Yeah. Um, I played, I played baseball for 16 years uh, of my life. I started when I was like five years old, I uh, played hockey for 15 years, played, played both sports right up to the junior level. Um, I did track and field as well. So, you know, I, I've been an athlete my whole life, but when I started doing professional wrestling, there was overlap with my other sports. Mm -hmm. So there'd often be days where I'd wake up first thing in the morning, I'd go to wrestling practice, and then I would have a hockey game later that day, or I'd have a baseball game later that day. Um, and I was doing both. So I, I always said, I, I'm like, I was like a wrestler doing these other sports because I brought that wrestling, that sports entertainment attitude to the ice or to the baseball field or you know when i was doing track and field i was i was like i was a wrestler doing it i had that same kind of fire and flair and personality and uh i just i, I love wrestling i love going in practicing learning new skills building my repertoire uh, working on the other aspects too but i mean a lot of it came naturally to me um you talk about the promos and my speaking ability i mean i've always enjoyed being in front of an audience i've always enjoyed uh, talking on screen mm -hmm. on a camera. Uh, I, I went to the uh, in in high school. Our team went to the finals of our province's uh, comedy improv competition. Oh, um, we we were actually the fourth uh, fourth overall team in the province in comedy improv, where you got to think on the spot and come up with the dialogue and incorporate oh. ideas from the audience. Uh, so I was in competitive improv, uh, which I think helped me a lot in yeah. professional wrestling. Um, you know, I loved acting. Uh, I loved being you know on film and. Uh, interacting with people. I picked up a lot of these skills along the way because I always wanted to be a professional wrestler. So I said, you know, what is it that makes a wrestler? So when you break it down, a professional wrestler, well, obviously it's physical. So you have to be an athlete. Um, there's an element of acting. So you have to be an actor, but you also have to be your own stuntman and you only get one take. Um, then you have to keep people entertained and sometimes change things up on the fly. So that's where the improvisation becomes a useful skill as well. I would really say the only thing that I didn't pick up that I would have liked to is yeah. amateur wrestling. I really feel uh -huh. that amateur wrestling would have given me that that feel of the competition and the mono and mono one on one. Get your mat man to the mat, pin mm -hmm. him one two three, score points, achieve great superiority. Um, I, I've studied amateur wrestling a lot, but I never got to actually do it because it's not as popular uh, here in Canada. Uh, oh, okay. Probably the same reason why my baseball career didn't take off because I was I was <laughs> a phenomenal baseball player. As good of a wrestler as I am, I, I actually believe I was as good of a baseball player as well. That you know, if uh, if I had had the same love for baseball that I do for professional wrestling, um, I'd probably be getting ready to walk on stage and get my Hall of Fame ring right now. That that's how good of a baseball player I was. Okay, so so Jeremy, actually, one thing that I'm really pops up to, into my mind at the moment that you're like a sponge with a talent. Everything that you go into, you just suck it in. And But one for me, you have wrestling blood, maybe from childhood, running through your veins. It was just a matter of time that you found your way into professional wrestling. And, yeah. and we, are, we are blessed here today with you. And... Actually, for me, the hidden gems, as you talked to early on, the diamond in the rough, is hopefully what I will bring out to a much more wider audience here in Europe and also, especially in Denmark, because I think I'm probably the only one in Denmark until now that knows who Jeremy Prophet is, but that, that's about to change. I promise you that. Yeah, that's um, that. What that is attributed, in my opinion, to the failure of adequate scouting in the yeah. world of professional wrestling. Exactly, because a talent of my caliber should not go unnoticed. Unfortunately, it's the setbacks faced by 
many Canadians. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's not just limited to Canadians. It's Europeans. It's Asians. It, it's, you know, I, I always say, to believe that the best wrestlers in the world, and not just the people who call themselves the best in the world, <laughs> yeah. but the, the objectively best wrestlers, to believe that they are the people you see on TV week in, week out, is as ludicrous as believing that the best musicians are the people you hear on the radio in the top 10. It's not a case of how talented you are, how good you are. A lot of times it's about who you know and who knows you. I've often said, and I get a little colorful with it, I'll try to keep it you know, PG for your audience, but no. uh, wrestling, unfortunately, becomes a business of who is um, you know, kissing the most backside. Who is uh, you know a, per a person who can make a promoter or a booker you know laugh and have a good time it it is sometimes valued more than someone who can actually deliver the best match or the best promo on a show. Uh, it it's a business of nepotism, bribery, uh, incestuous relationships. Yeah, you, know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. Horse trading, all these kinds of things. It's no different than politics, really. I guess that's why we call it politics. And yeah. I've been someone. <laughs> Who's, who's always been about coming in, doing the best job I can. And, and I'm not about the socializing. I don't, I don't drink. I've never drank alcohol in my life. I've never done a drug in my life. I, I'm not about partying and these kinds of things. I'm about wrestling. Uh, you hear all these interviews where people will say, oh, my favorite part of wrestling is the road trips. My favorite part is the, the, the after parties, the, you know, these kinds of things. It's like, well, m my favorite part of the wrestling is the actual wrestling, the, exactly. the thing that I want to make my living doing. I'm very serious about this. I'm passionate about this. And I'm not the kind of person who's in this for anything other than being successful at my chosen profession. No, exactly. But it's like the locker room politics is, is taking over more and more. Instead of let's, let's see what it's all about. It's all about wrestling, not all the stuff and blabbering and the best catering and so on but but jeremy let's let's go a little bit further back again because i sometimes i like to stay in the past but we'll we'll come to the present in a, in All time good. in time due but but let's take us back to your first match so my first match would have been about um i started in december of 20, 2003, my first match would have been in May of 2004. Oh. So remarkably, uh, in, in merely five months, I was able to get in the ring for the first time, have an actual match uh, in front of 2,000 people, which was a great crowd, even by today's standards, a great oh, crowd, yeah. uh, in a town called Joliet, uh, Quebec here. Oh. And it was, a, it was a very good match in terms of protecting the talent that was in it. Because, I mean, if I had been called upon to do a singles match, um, you know, putting in 15, 20 minutes right away in my debut, I, I would have done it. I would have, I would have jumped at the opportunity. But it probably wouldn't have been the most ideal for someone who had never performed in front of an audience before. And so it was actually a three-team, three nine-man tag, I guess you could call it, or a yeah. six-man, let me think about it. If a three-team, if, if two versus two versus two, is a three-team tag match. I guess this would be a three-team, six-man tag match, although it involves nine people. So it was yeah. three teams of three, elimination. Ah. And yeah. um, what's, what's great about it is that a lot of the people in that match are still wrestling today. So we've, we've had pretty good longevity. Some have taken breaks and come back and whatnot, but uh, it's been pretty good longevity by most okay. of the people who were, who were in that match. And uh, that was my debut. Um, First move I ever did. My first, I got the tag. I entered the match. I did a springboard spinning heel kick. Um, oh. <laughs> great, great moment. And um, yeah, you know, we, we, we didn't win the match, uh, but we put on a great performance. I think everyone remembered it. And I'm very happy with my debut. One of the other things that I think is really cool in the story of my debut and when they, when they make the, the movie of the story of my life, um, I'm sure it'll be a great uh, heartwarming scene because um, earlier in that day, Uh, the, the match, the, the teams actually changed because of um, people arrived late and Jacques got mad and kind of fired two people on the spot <laughs> because they showed up late. True story. And so because of that, uh, two other spots opened and some of the teams had to be changed around. So one of the people that got fired 
um, he ended up, uh, he was supposed to be on the team that I was on. And yeah. instead they, they replaced him with uh, the, the guy who had been the person, uh, his name is Paulie Platinum. Uh, he had been the person who brought me into wrestling. He was my, my good friend's younger brother. So we actually ended up on the same team in the debut. So I think that it's really cool. The person who brought me into wrestling was also my partner in the very first match that I had on, on my first show. Oh, but, but let's go on from there because you have a quite long career. Yeah. You, okay, everyone can see that, but let's take some stopping points towards now. Tell us about some of the important matches that has been uh, career-defining. I've had many career-defining matches. Uh, one of the things that upsets me when I peruse the internet is uh, one of those sites like Cage Match Database. I think yeah. they have me listed at around 600 matches, which means that they've easily missed over half the matches I've done in my career. Um, <laughs> cer course. Certain promotions here are not that well documented or whatnot, but I've had I've had easily close to 1,200 matches, uh, oh. if not more in my career. I guess I've not been that good with documenting it myself, but uh, having performed regularly on a weekly basis since 2005, having done tours where I've done, like, I, and I think they got this one right, but I've literally done tours where we did 30 days and I did double duty most of those days, sometimes triple duty um, <laughs> because I, well, I'm, I'm the indestructible Jeremy Prophet. So, yeah. you know, who else can do it? Who better? Um, but yeah, no, not, not, it's not enough. My matches have been documented and, um, They, they even have my height wrong on there, which I find funny. They list me at 5'8", which anyone who watches any of my matches um, <laughs> can, can tell I'm a lot taller than 5'8". My driver's license uh, lists me at 5'10 and a half, so I don't know why I'm listed at 5'8", but it's good because I feel like a lot of my opponents might see that. They expect some little shrimp to come yeah. walking in, and then there's me, and I'm taller than them. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll let that be. But if anyone wants to jump on cage match and correct that, uh, you're more than welcome to because Jeremy Prophet is, is actually 5'10 and a half, uh, not 5'8". Uh, that's but so but maybe it, it could work to your advantage. Possibly. Yeah, Possibly. they could. Hey, I'll, I'll take any advantage. You know, yeah. it's, uh, it, it's, it's a case of uh, if they want to get that wrong and, you know, someone wants to actually scrutinize it, they'll see that, hey, you know, this is the truth. And I'm all about the truth. That's why I'm the harbinger of truth. I don't say anything that's not the truth because it's very easy to live your life telling the truth. You don't have to think of a lie and then think of the next lie to justify that one. The next, that's why people can't cut good promos because they lie into you. They are lying to you. Jeremy Prophet can just speak and free flow because it's from here to here. And that's all there is to it. I don't have to lie and tell you I'm something that I'm not. I'm always living to be something that I am and to strive to be even better. So I can then use that to my advantage as well. So anyways, uh, you asked me about highlights. I'll get back on track. Yeah, um, <laughs> but I, I, don't worry. Just, it's, when it comes to the highlights, uh, Nikolai, it's, it's yeah. like it, it's too many to name. Um, looking back on my career, I feel so blessed to have gotten the chance to share the ring with people who have, you know, done so much. People who've inspired me uh, in professional wrestling, and now I get to be one of their peers. Uh, I think that's one of the greatest uh, compliments to anyone is that you know I can go to somebody and say, "I, I watched you. You inspired me to want to do this. Uh, yeah. I do. I do this maneuver." because I saw you do this one that's similar or things of that nature. And, and, and it's, my influences come from all over wrestling. I, I, I think I'm the most eclectic person in wrestling. Um, I think I'm a master of, of just about every style. And so my influences aren't just limited to, I like wrestlers that fit this dynamic, or I like guys who uh, cut this style of promo. Uh, I take from, from the best and I incorporate all of it because why can't you do all of it? Why, why I don't want to have a weakness at anything. I don't feel I have a weakness at anything. So There are so many people I've rubbed shoulders with and crossed paths with that have been inspirations to me. Um, talking about career highlights, I mean, uh, get, getting to wrestle someone uh, like the almighty Bobby Lashley, it, definitely a, a career highlight. And, and beyond that, oh. getting to spend a weekend with Bobby Lashley, learn from him, get along with him. Um, and then our match, which wasn't even supposed to really happen. It wasn't advertised. But Bobby took such a liking to me that he, he more or less demanded to the promoter that he work with me on this show. He was originally supposed to work with Harry Smith and they did a, a bit of a little match, but Lashley really wanted to work with me. So I always love telling the story because like he told me that day, he's like, we are going to work. We are going to work. I saw what you did. He saw me wrestle the night before and he said, I saw what you did. I want to get in there with you. And he goes up to the promoter the next day and he's like, you know, my neck is kind of sore 
Um, I, I don't know if I could really work tonight, but if you gave me Jeremy, I know he and I could have a good night. <laughs> oh, so that's, that's, the tip of, that's the tip of the iceberg. Sorry, gets better. Yeah. So the promoter says to him, well, I got you booked with Harry Smith. We've been advertising this. And he's like, oh, well, I can do something with Harry. But maybe, you know, we have Jeremy come in after and then like he jumps me and then he and I kind of have a match. And then the promoter's like, well, I mean, we really kind of want you and Harry. And don't get me wrong. This promoter loves me. Love yeah. to death. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll give him a shout out. Matt, Matt Garrett always treated me well in Barrie, Ontario. And then Lashley says to him, let me put it to you like this. Um, my neck is really hurting. So um, either I wrestle Jeremy tonight or uh, maybe I just don't wrestle at all. How about that? <laughs> That's how I got my match with Bobby Lashley. Okay, and nice. I'll, 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 take it, I'll take it even further in, um, in, in talking about the match. It ended up being myself and, and RJ City. Uh, he's someone who's, who's done pretty well for himself. I see him doing his interviews and uh, stuff with AEW now. Uh, so yeah. with myself and RJ City against Bobby Lashley and Harry Smith. And so they have Bobby and Harry scheduled to go over. And I remember Bobby turning to Harry and he's like, you know, this finish that they want us to do where we hit them with our finishers and whatever. Why don't we just change it up, man? Let's just change it. Have them slip out, roll us up. One, two, three. Let's just give them the win. Let's just do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, no word of a lie. If I'm lying, I'm dying. Yeah, that, that's the truth. That okay. Bobby took that much of a liking to me that he not only strong armed me into a match with him, yeah. but but he also wanted me to go over on him and and like was thinking of just shoot changing the finish so that uh, that, that that would happen. <laughs> oh, um, nice. Yeah. And I've had great experiences with all these people, and I love Bobby Lashley. I think he's done so much. Yeah. Um, you know, for for you know for young uh, black kids watching wrestling. That you know can finally see a WWE champion, you know, representing them, you know, as as someone, you know, I'm 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 a proud Canadian. Uh, I'm I'm proud of my heritage, you know. I'm I'm biracial. My mom's black. My dad is white, and, and I'm very proud of, of both my identities. And you know, to see Bobby Lashley, I was there um, when Bobby Lashley he performed in Toronto. Him and John Cena did a match, and after the match, they kind of got into a little. Thing and he speared Cena, got one of the biggest pops, and that was setting up the Great American Bash in, I think, oh. 2007. And yeah. I remember go going with my dad and saying, I want to see this. I want to see Lashley <laughs> become the first Black WWE champion. And uh, I, was, I was really devastated when he didn't win and then and they, they didn't pull the trigger on it. So to see him achieve the success that he has, you know, these past couple of years, it, it, it's amazing. And he's a, he's a great wrestler and he's a great human being outside the ring, too. And again, a great representative of the black community. Can't say enough good about Bobby Lashley. Uh, the, the kind of person I would like to be uh, once I reach that level. Yeah, he, he's really taking uh, the almighty into his heart. He is yeah. really a joy for me to watch in the ring. He is everything. He should really, he deserves, if you ask me, another run with the title. Absolutely. Absolutely. Without a doubt. Yeah. So, and, um, you know, like I said, there, there are many people who inspire me. Another another career highlight was getting to wrestle Rey Mysterio, oh. who, you know, a lot of people don't know my my I, I've wrestled a who's who of people in wrestling. I've wrestled uh, half the WWE Hall of Fame wing. I've wrestled people who have, you know, on their way up who are now, you know, challenging for championships and making a name for themselves on TV. Um, and, and the thing is, when you're Canadian, you get a few opportunities here and there. But, you know, Americans, they, they have the, 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 the silver spoon uh, given to them. They have the easy path. Uh, Canadians, it's a lot tougher. But, yeah, there are guys who work, you know, opening match who are now probably making six figures on TV on shows that I was main eventing. Um, we don't have as easy of a path. But, yeah, wrestled Rey Mysterio. He's okay. an absolute woman. Um, you know, amazing in the ring and uh, just a great guy. And, you know, again, former WWE champion, former world champion, uh, one of the greatest cruiserweights of all time. Uh, a, a funny sidebar is I actually didn't enjoy Rey Mysterio that much when I used to watch WCW. Um, <laughs> I even had the chance to wrestle Juventud Guerrera, uh, oh. not that long ago, just right before COVID. And I told him, I said, you know, you were always my favorite of the cruiserweights. Uh, I hated that Rey Mysterio beat you so many times because I didn't like Rey because Rey was always beating me. <laughs> He was always yeah. beating psychosis. And like those were my two favorites of the cruiserweights. You know, I don't know if it was just, you know, I, you know, guys with, with long black hair were more my thing, but um, I always liked Hoobie and psychosis and La Parca and uh, didn't like Ray that much, but absolutely just, you know, fell in love with Ray's work in, in WWE. 
when he was on SmackDown, when he was world champion, he, he, his, his work in WWE, how he could work with guys so much bigger than him. Uh, I more enjoyed watching him wrestle big guys than watching him wrestle cruiserweights. But uh, yeah, getting to work with Ray was, uh, was an awesome experience. Uh, although I even said to Hoopy, I'm like, I got to work with Ray, but me working with you uh, in front of a much smaller <laughs> crowd is a bigger deal because I was actually yeah. a big fan of yours all the time. Oh, um, but but Jeremy, the clock is ticking because I think we will go to part two in a little bit of a moment. So that's why I sent you uh, two invitations just to be sure that we had enough time because sure. I had a I had a feeling this could not keep within uh, 40 minutes. So, but. One thing, I have a, a question for you in yes. part two. So I think actually we will uh, cut this now, give you a little bit of break if you have to. I know probably one thing that comes to my mind before we will go to part two, Jeremy, you're, you're talking about your indestructible. I think you should probably consider in being the Wolverine of professional wrestling. <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think Brian Cage and I will have to fight it out again to uh, see who the real Wolverine is of professional yeah. wrestling. And I'm Can and I'm Canadian, so I got an advantage on him. So if he he wants to step in the ring with me again, I'll be I'll be happy to whoop his tail one yeah. more time. <laughs> Just like the last time, Brian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he will for sure. He's actually I, underused. I, I did the first time. Yeah, yeah. He's underused at the moment. So, <laughs> but Jeremy, thank you for part one. We'll switch to part two in just a minute. So uh, see you in a bit. Audience, I am a little long-winded. I like yeah. talking a lot. It's why the promoters uh, pay me the big bucks, although it's not as much big bucks as I'd like to be making. Um, you know, it's one of the <laughs> things that I bring to the table is I'm never at a loss for words. But, but so, please, I want to have that wind mouth all the time. <laughs> so... Uh, as I was saying, started yeah. with Jacques Rougeau. You know, we, we know his credentials. He's accomplished a lot. Multiple-time yeah. tag team champion, intercontinental champion. I wanted to be trained by the best. And so I was actually thinking originally of going out west and training with the Hearts. Uh, you know, I, I was the only school we knew of in Canada. And um, then I discovered Jacques Rougeau's wrestling school, and I heard he was training younger students, people my age. I started training. I was about... Uh, like 17, 16 or 17 years old. I had just finished high school. So that's why I said, you know what? That might be a good fit for me because I'll be surrounded by other students around the same age. Um, I was fortunate that I had a good friend of mine, one of my best friends, uh, his younger brother had started training with Jacques. And then we were having just, you know, the graduation ceremony and we were all there together. And he said, you know, maybe you should come give this a try. I know you're a big wrestling fan. Everyone in school knew I was the, the biggest wrestling fan. And so I said, <laughs> For sure. I mean, I knew I was going to do this. It's like literally in my high school yearbook that, you know, I was going to be a champion in wrestling because I knew I was going to find a way into this because it's the only thing I've wanted to do with my life. Um, I'm, I'm very passionate about professional wrestling. I want to make my living doing professional wrestling. I want to be a champion and I, I will accept nothing less because for me, it's not a side hobby. It's not a I'm just happy to be here and participate. It's like, no, I want to win. I want to be successful. I want to be a standard in professional wrestling that people need to be able to be on the level of Jeremy Prophet. And I don't speak from a place of cockiness. I don't try to sell people on things I can't deliver on. You know, you watch me perform and you'll see the abilities yeah. I bring to the table. And I always say, I have yet to meet my equal. And don't think just because someone's on TV and they've been handed championships that that means they're better than me. Uh, because quite frankly, I've yet to meet someone who looks as good as I do, who talks as well as I do, and does the thing that's actually the most important, which is wrestle as well as I do and as diversely as I do. So I've yet to meet someone who can do all these things. I've seen people who can do one or two. I've seen people who can do maybe one or two better than me, but I've yet to see <laughs> someone who can do them all as good or better than me. So if you want to know who Jeremy Prophet is, my body of work speaks for itself. You know, hell, my body speaks for itself. But when yeah. it comes down to it, you can scrutinize me under any kind of a microscope and you'll see I stand the test of time. Why I've not been picked up by a major company as of now, I think that more speaks to the lack of scouting in professional wrestling because I think I could make a tremendous amount of revenue for any of the top companies anywhere in the world. So it, it's not a matter of if, it's really a matter of when because like the saying says, you can't keep a good man down. The cream rises to the top. 
And I know that my time will come, whether it comes organically or whether I have to push the envelope and just be my aggressive, outspoken, controversial self to get people to pay attention one way or another. You're going to be hearing about Jeremy Prophet for years and years to come. You know, they're going to do the documentary story on my life, and maybe they'll be using footage from this interview. I say it yeah. in all of them because I speak it into existence, <laughs> and I'm sure it's going to happen. Yeah, I, I think so too. But Jeremy, one thing yeah. that I really love about this and the way that your expression and so on, I could actually see a whole lot of wrestlers, maybe 99% of the wrestlers that could just learn from just seeing the first five minutes of this interview because I've seen so damn shitty promos in wrestling. Yeah. Just, hey, to, what, just to be a little bit modest, not to, to boost your uh, self-confidence, but damn, you're good, Jeremy. Well, well, thank you. I mean, this, this is Jeremy Prophet 24 hours a day. Uh, for the longest time, I, I tried to fit the mold. You know, you get a lot of wrestling school, you gotta, you gotta fall in line, you gotta keep your head down, you gotta be humble. But but to be fair, that 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 didn't really get me as far as I would be. So a case of noise, it's a case of being controversial, making sure people are going to pay attention, and you know making sure you're going to get yourself to the place that you want to be. You got to speak it into existence. You got to believe it. I have no insecurity about anything in my professional wrestling game. You put a live mic in front of me. You tell me you need me on a plane to go to Japan tomorrow. You need me at, at TV for whatever event. I'm ready to do it. I, I'm ready yesterday. And I always say that. I don't got to go and, and tan myself and, and pump myself up and uh, you know, <laughs> no. practice in front of a mirror. And all. I've done that, man. I've been doing this for 16 years. Yeah. 16 years. Going to be 17 next month. Whoa. 17 years in the business. And on top of that, I, I've never even had an injury. Like, there is no chink in my armor, man. I, I've not been, I've not missed a day of work for anything. I've always been 100% healthy, no surgeries, no broken bones, no concussions. This brain works 100% intact. Probably why my promos are a lot better than those other crumb bums that you've seen uh, doing horrible promos yeah. out there. I think uh, they a, I think some of the brain cells might have uh, magically disappeared. Yeah, well, one I could got say about that. No, one could say that, my brain 100% works. <laughs> One could say probably uh, the wizard of uh, professional wrestling or what he likes to call himself at the moment. He has been around um, magically um, put them away in the magic realm. But uh, Jeremy, let's go back to uh, one thing that I'm very interested in. It is your first steps in professional wrestling. When you started at wrestling school, take us all back to where it all started. Your first baby steps to watch a professional wrestling ring. So like I was saying, there was a good friend of mine, his younger brother had started training with Jacques Rougeau, had probably been doing it for about a year, invited me to go there. So I jumped in head first right away. I assumed, you know, I was going to get in there, probably not even get in the ring, maybe just, you know, listen to some of the fundamentals and the, the, the real rudiments of professional wrestling, not get a chance to really cut my teeth on it. Uh, but to my surprise, on the first day, they invited us in the ring. There was myself, and I think there was maybe one other new student who had shown up that day. And then they put us in the beginners group, which had started, I believe, uh, a week or two before that. So they had a two-week advance on us. Threw us right in there. First thing they taught us was how to circle, then how to lock up, and then they allowed us to take some bumps. And that's what I was really looking forward to because, you know, I had, <laughs> yeah. I, I had seen tough enough. And I saw how, like, when these uh, people that they brought in for Tough Enough took their first bumps, it really just knocked the wind out of them. And then, you know, some of them you could see in their face right away. They wanted to just throw in the towel right away. Yeah. Um, so I was excited to bump. That was the first thing. So right away, they, they told us the techniques. They said, you know, you got to tuck your chin, spread your arms out, and brace for impact. I went down, took that first bump. I was expecting it to be the most painful thing in the world. And I did it. <laughs> I did it in a yeah. ring that many here will consider the stiffest ring in our entire province, if not the <laughs> entire country. Probably not the entire country. I've been around and found a few that would give it a run for its money. But <laughs> definitely, I would say stiffest ring in our province. I didn't yeah. know at the time. It was all I was used to. It's why now I don't mind bumping in any of the rings here, because <laughs> that one that I started in, that was that was practically like bumping on, on, on cement. So okay. Whoa. I took that first bump. and. I was okay. It was fine. 
And then, like, you know, I remember the trainers, like, they looked at me, uh, not Jacques, but the guys that he had instructing us. They're like, wow, this one, you know, this one's a natural. You know, he took that first bump uh, just as well as anybody here. You know, you're going to be good, kid. And, um, you know, then after that, it was just consistent training. One or two times a week, uh, different instructor, Jacques himself sometimes. And, uh, and I loved it. I loved every moment of it. I, I, I'm a person who uh, doesn't particularly enjoy getting up at the uh, absolute crack of dawn. But uh, <laughs> classes were early morning in uh, very cold winter Quebec, Canada. Ah. So uh, while it was not the most ideal conditions to be out and about on the road, making the long drive and then putting your body through some abuse, uh, I loved it. I, I, I would stay, I, I would be maybe not the first one there, but I would definitely uh, be in the first couple of ones there, but I'd always be the last one to leave. I, I would not want to leave there. I would want to be in there after class was over, trying different things, hitting the ropes, getting up on the top rope, jumping down onto the crash mats, uh, working on different maneuvers. Uh, that, that's what it was like for me. I was always the last one to leave. I was the one locking up. Uh, I was the one that you could not pull away from there because that was all I wanted to do. And, and a footnote on that too, is yeah. that, and not a lot of people know this. I don't know if I've ever said this in any interviews, oh. um, but I, I've been an athlete my whole life. Yeah. Um, I played, I played baseball for 16 years uh, of my life. I started when I was like five years old, I uh, played hockey for 15 years, played, played both sports right up to the junior level. Um, I did track and field as well. So, you know, I, I've been an athlete my whole life. But when I started doing professional wrestling, there was overlap with my other sports. Mm -hmm. So there'd often be days where I'd wake up first thing in the morning, I'd go to wrestling practice, and then I would have a hockey game later that day, or I'd have a baseball game later that day. Um, and I was doing both. So I, I always said, I, I'm like, I was like a wrestler doing these other sports because I brought that wrestling, that sports entertainment attitude to the ice or to the baseball field. Or, you know, when I was doing track and field, I was, I was like, I was a wrestler doing it. I had that same kind of fire and flair and personality. And uh, I just, I, I love wrestling. I love going in, practicing, learning new skills, building my repertoire, uh, working on the other aspects too. But I mean, a lot of it came naturally to me. Um, you talk about the promos and my speaking ability. I mean, I've always enjoyed being in front of an audience. I've always enjoyed uh, talking on screen, mm -hmm. on a camera. Uh, I, I went to the, uh, in, in high school, our team went to the finals of our province's uh, comedy improv competition. Oh. Um, we, we were actually the fourth, uh, fourth overall team in the province in comedy improv, where you got to think on the spot and come up with the dialogue and incorporate oh. ideas from the audience. Uh, so I was in competitive improv. Uh, which I think helped me a lot in professional wrestling. Um, you know, I loved acting. Uh, I loved being, you know, on film and uh, interacting with people. I picked up a lot of these skills along the way because I always wanted to be a professional wrestler. So I said, you know, what is it that makes a wrestler? So when you break it down, a professional wrestler, well, obviously it's physical. So you have to be an athlete. Um, there's an element of acting. So you have to be an actor, but you also have to be your own stuntman and you only get one take. Um, then you have to keep people entertained and sometimes change things up on the fly. So that's where the improvisation becomes a useful skill as well. I, I would really say the only thing that I didn't pick up that I would have liked to is yeah. amateur wrestling. I really feel uh -huh. that amateur wrestling would have given me that, that feel of the competition and the mono and mono one-on-one, -on -one, get your mat, man to the mat, pin mm -hmm. him one, two, three, score points, achieve great superiority. Um, I, I've studied amateur wrestling a lot, but I never got to actually do it because it's not as popular uh, here in Canada. Uh, oh, okay. probably, probably the same reason why my baseball career didn't take off because I was, <laughs> I was a phenomenal baseball player. As good of a wrestler as I am, I, I actually believe I was as good of a baseball player as well. That, you know, if, uh, if I had had the same love for baseball that I do for professional wrestling, um, I'd probably be getting ready to walk on stage and get my Hall of Fame ring right now. That, that's how good of a baseball player I was. Okay. So, so, Jeremy, actually, one thing that I'm really pops up to, into my mind at the moment, that you're like a sponge with a talent. Everything that you go into, you just suck it in. And, but one, for me, you have wrestling blood, maybe from childhood running through your wings it was just a matter of time that you found your way into professional wrestling and and yeah. we are we are blessed here today with you and actually for me the hidden 
gems, as you talked to early on, the diamond in the rough is hopefully what I will bring out to a much more wider audience here in Europe and also especially in Denmark, because I think I'm probably the only one in Denmark until now that knows who Jeremy Prophet is, but that, that's about to change. I promise you that. Yeah, that's, um, that, what, that is attributed, in my opinion, to the failure of adequate scouting in the yeah. world of professional wrestling. Exactly. Because a talent of my caliber should not go unnoticed. Unfortunately, it's the setbacks faced by many Canadians. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's not just limited to Canadians. It's Europeans. It's Asians. It, it's, you know, I, I always say, to believe that the best wrestlers in the world and not just the people who call themselves the best in the world, yeah. but the, the objectively best wrestlers, to believe that they are the people you see on TV week in, week out, is as ludicrous as believing that the best musicians are the people you hear on the radio in the top 10. It's not a case of how talented you are, how good you are. A lot of times it's about who you know and who knows you. I've often said, and I get a little colorful with it. I'll try to keep it, you know, PG for your audience. But no. uh, wrestling, unfortunately, becomes a business of who is, um, you know, kissing the most backside. Who is, uh, <laughs> you know, a, per a person who can make a promoter or a booker, you know, laugh and have a good time it, it is sometimes valued more than someone who can actually deliver the best match or the best promo on a show. Uh, it, it's a business of nepotism, bribery, uh, incestuous relationships. You, know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. Horse trading, all these kinds of things. It's no different than politics, really. I guess that's why we call it politics. And yeah. I've been someone <laughs> who's, who's always been about coming in, doing the best job I can. And, and I'm not about the socializing. I don't, I don't drink. I've never drank alcohol in my life. I've never done a drug in my life. I, I'm not about partying and these kinds of things. I'm about wrestling. Uh, you hear all these interviews where people will say, oh, my favorite part of wrestling is the road trips. My favorite part is the, the, the after parties, the, you know, these kinds of things. It's like, well, m my favorite part of the wrestling is the actual wrestling. The, exactly. the thing that I want to make my living doing. I'm very serious about this. I'm passionate about this. And I'm not the kind of person who's in this for anything other than being successful at my chosen profession. No, exactly. But it's like the locker room politics is... Is taking over more and more instead of let's let's see what it's all about. It's all about wrestling, not all the stuff and blabbering and the best catering and so on. But but Jeremy, let's let's go a little bit further back again because I sometimes I like to stay in the past, but we'll we'll come to the present in a, in all time good. in time due. But but let's take us back to your first match. So my first match would have been about, um, I started in December of 20, 2003. My first match would have been in May of 2004. Oh. So remarkably, uh, in, in merely five months, I was able to get in the ring for the first time, have an actual match uh, in front of 2,000 people which was a great crowd, even by today's standards, a great oh, crowd yeah. uh, in a town called Joliet, uh, Quebec here. Oh. And it was, a, it was a very good match in terms of protecting the talent that was in it. Because, I mean, if I had been called upon to do a singles match, um, you know, putting in 15, 20 minutes right away in my debut, <laughs> I, I would have done it. I would have, I would have jumped at the opportunity. But it probably wouldn't have been the most ideal for someone who had never performed in front of an audience before. And so it was actually a three-team, three nine-man tag, I guess you could call it, or a yeah. six-man, let me think about it. If a three-team, if, if two versus two versus two is a three-team tag match, I guess this would be a three-team, six-man tag match, although it involves nine people. So it was yeah. three teams of three, elimination. Ah. And uh. um, what's, what's great about it is that a lot of the people in that match are still wrestling today. So we've, we've had pretty good longevity. Some have taken breaks and come back and whatnot, but uh, it's been pretty good longevity by most of okay. the people who were, who were in that match. And uh, that was my debut. Um, first move I ever did. My first, I got the tag. I entered the match. I did a springboard spinning heel kick. 
Um, oh. <laughs> great, great moment. And uh, yeah, you know, we, we, we didn't win the match, uh, but we put on a great performance. I think everyone remembered it. And I'm very happy with my debut. One of the other things that I think is really cool in the story of my debut and when they, when they make the, the movie of the story of my life, um, I'm sure it'll be a great uh, heartwarming scene because um, earlier in that day, uh, the, the match, the, the teams actually changed because of um, people arrived late and Jacques got mad and kind of fired two people on the spot because they showed up late. <laughs> True story. And so because of that, uh, two other spots opened and some of the teams had to be changed around. So one of the people that got fired, um, he ended up, uh, he was supposed to be on the team that I was on. And yeah. instead they, they replaced him with uh, the, the guy who had been the person, uh, his name is Paulie Platinum. Uh, he had been the person who brought me into wrestling. He was my, my good friend's younger brother. So we actually ended up on the same team in the debut. So I think that it's really cool. The person who brought me into wrestling was also my partner in the very first match that I had on, on my first show. Oh, but, but let's go on from there because you have a quite long career. Yeah. You, okay, everyone can see that, but let's take some stopping points towards now. Tell us about some of the important matches that has been uh, career-defining. I've had many career-defining matches. Uh, one of the things that upsets me when I peruse the internet is uh, one of those sites like Cage Match Database. I think yeah. they have me listed at around 600 matches, which means that they've easily missed over half the matches I've done in my career. Um, <laughs> cer course. Certain promotions here are not that well documented or whatnot, but I've had I've had easily close to 1,200 matches, uh, oh. if not more in my career. I guess I've not been that good with documenting it myself, but uh, having performed regularly on a weekly basis since 2005, having done tours where I've done, like, I, and I think they got this one right, but I've literally done tours where we did 30 days and I did double duty most of those days, sometimes triple duty um, <laughs> because, I, well, I'm, I'm the indestructible Jeremy Prophet. So, yeah. you know, who else can do it? Who better? Um, but yeah, no, not, not, it's not enough. My matches have been documented and, um, They, they even have my height wrong on there, which I find funny. They list me at 5'8", which anyone who watches any of my matches um, <laughs> can, can tell I'm a lot taller than 5'8". My driver's license uh, lists me at 5'10 and a half, so I don't know why I'm listed at 5'8", but it's good because I feel like a lot of my opponents might see that. They expect some little shrimp to come yeah. walking in, and then there's me, and I'm taller than them. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll let that be. But if anyone wants to jump on cage match and correct that, uh, you're more than welcome to because Jeremy Prophet is, is actually 5'10 and a half, uh, not 5'8". Uh, that's but but maybe it, it could work to your advantage. Possibly. Yeah, Possibly. they could. Hey, I'll, I'll take any advantage. You know, yeah. it's, uh, it, it's, it's a case of uh, if they want to get that wrong and, you know, someone wants to actually scrutinize it, they'll see that, hey, you know, this is the truth. And I'm all about the truth. That's why I'm the harbinger of truth. I don't say anything that's not the truth because it's very easy to live your life telling the truth. You don't have to think of a lie and then think of the next lie to justify that one. The next, that's why people can't cut good promos because they lie into you. They are lying to you. Jeremy Prophet can just speak and free flow because it's from here to here. And that's all there is to it. I don't have to lie and tell you I'm something that I'm not. I'm always living to be something that I am and to strive to be even better so I can then use that to my advantage as well. So anyways, uh, you asked me about highlights. I'll get back on track. Yeah, um, <laughs> but I, I, don't worry. Just, it's, when it comes to the highlights, uh, Nikolai, it's, it's yeah. like it, it's too many to name. Um, looking back on my career, I feel so blessed to have gotten the chance to share the ring with people who have, you know, done so much. People who've inspired me uh, in professional wrestling, and now I get to be one of their peers. Uh, I think that's one of the greatest uh, compliments to anyone is that you know I can go to somebody and say, "I, I watched you. You inspired me to want to do this. Uh, yeah. I do. I do this maneuver." because I saw you do this one that's similar or things of that nature. And, and, and it's, my influences come from all over wrestling. I, I, I think I'm the most eclectic person in wrestling. Um, I think I'm a master of, of just about every style. And so my influences aren't just limited to, I like wrestlers that fit this dynamic, or I like guys who uh, cut this style of promo. Uh, I take from, from the best and I incorporate all of it because why can't you do all of it? Why, why I don't want to have a weakness at anything. I don't feel I have a weakness at anything. So There are so many people I've rubbed shoulders with and crossed paths with that have been inspirations to me. Um, talking about career highlights, I mean, uh, get, getting to wrestle someone uh, like 
the almighty Bobby Lashley. It, definitely a, a career highlight. And, and beyond that, right. getting to spend a weekend with Bobby Lashley, learn from him, get along with him. Um, and then our match, which wasn't even supposed to really happen. It wasn't advertised. But Bobby took such a liking to me that he, he more or less demanded to the promoter that he work with me on this show. He was originally supposed to work with Harry Smith. And they did a, a bit of a little match, but Lashley really wanted to work with me. So I always love telling the story because, like, he told me that day, he's like, we are going to work. We are going to work. I saw what you did. He saw me wrestle the night before, and he said, I saw what you did. I want to get in there with you. And he goes up to the promoter the next day, and he's like, you know, my neck is kind of sore. Um, I, I don't know if I could really work tonight, but if you gave me Jeremy, I know he and I could have a good night. <laughs> oh. well, that's, that's, the tip of, that's the tip of the iceberg. Story gets better. Yeah. So the promoter says to him, well, I got you booked with Harry Smith. We've been advertising this. And he's like, oh, well, I can do something with Harry. But maybe, you know, we have Jeremy come in after. And then, like, he jumps me. And then he and I kind of have a match. And then the promoter's like, well, I mean, we really kind of want you and Harry. And don't get me wrong. This promoter loves me. Loves yeah. the death. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll give him a shout out. Matt, Matt Garrett always treated me well in Barrie, Ontario. And then Lashley says to him, let me put it to you like this. Um, my neck is really hurting. So um, either I wrestle Jeremy tonight or... Uh, Maybe I just don't wrestle at all. How about that? <laughs> That's how I got my match with Bobby Lashley. Okay, and nice. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it even further in um, in talking about the match. It ended up being myself and and RJ City. Uh, he's someone who's who's done pretty well for himself. I see him doing his interviews and uh, stuff with AEW now. Uh, so yeah. with myself and RJ City against Bobby Lashley and Harry Smith. And so they have Bobby and Harry scheduled to go over. And I remember Bobby turning to Harry and he's like. You know this finish that they want us to do where we hit them with our finishers and whatever? Why don't we just change it up, man? Let's just change it. Have them slip out. Roll us up. One, two, three. Let's just give them the win. Let's just do it. <laughs> so, uh, no word of a lie. If I'm lying, I'm dying. Yeah. That, that's the truth. That okay. Bobby took that much of a liking to me that he not only strong-armed me into a match with him, yeah. but, but he also wanted me to go over on him and, and like was thinking of just shoot changing the finish so that uh, th that, that would happen. <laughs> Ah, um, oh, nice. Yeah. And I've had great experiences with all these people. And I love Bobby Lashley. I think he's done so much, yeah. um, you know, for, for you know, for young uh, black kids watching wrestling that, you know, can finally see a WWE champion, you know, representing them, you know, as, as someone, you know, I'm, 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 I'm a proud Canadian. Uh, I'm, I'm proud of my heritage. You know, I'm, I'm biracial. My mom's black. My dad is white. And, and I'm very proud of, of both my identities and you know to see Bobby Lashley I was there um when Bobby Lashley he performed in Toronto him and John Cena did a match and after the match they kind of got into a little thing and he speared Cena got one of the biggest pops and that was setting up the Great American Bash in I think oh. 2007 and yeah. I remember go going with my dad and saying I want to see this I want to see Lashley mm -hmm. become the first black WWE champion and uh I was I was really devastated when he didn't win and then and they, they didn't pull the trigger on it so to see him achieve the success that he has, you know, these past couple of years, it, it, it's amazing. And he's a, he's a great wrestler and he's a great human being outside the ring too. And, and again, a great representative of the black community. Can't say enough good about Bobby Lashley. Uh, the, the kind of person I would like to be uh, once I reach that level. Yeah. He, he's really taking uh, the almighty into his heart. He is yeah. really a joy for me to watch in the ring. He is everything. He should really, he deserves, if you ask me, another run with the title. Absolutely. Absolutely. Without a doubt. Yeah. So, and, um, you know, like I said, there, there are many people who inspire me. Another another career highlight was getting to wrestle Rey Mysterio. Oh. Who, you know, a lot of people don't know. My, my, I, I've wrestled a who's who of people in wrestling. I've wrestled half the WWE Hall of Fame wing. I've wrestled people who have, you know, on their way up who are now, you know, challenging for championships and making a name for themselves on TV. Um, and, and the thing is, when you're Canadian, you get a few opportunities here and there. But, you know, Americans, they, they have the, 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 the silver spoon uh, given to them. They have the easy path. Uh, Canadians, it's a lot tougher. But, yeah, there are guys who work, you know, opening match who are now probably making six figures on TV on shows that I was main eventing. Um, we don't have as easy of a path. But, yeah, wrestled Rey Mysterio. He's okay. absolute man. Um, you know, amazing in the ring and uh, just a great guy. And, you know, again, former WWE champion, former world champion, uh, one of the greatest cruiserweights of all time. 
uh, a funny sidebar is I actually didn't enjoy Rey Mysterio that much when I used to watch WCW. Um, <laughs> I even had the chance to wrestle Juventud Guerrera uh, oh. not that long ago, just right before COVID. And I told him, I said, you know, you were always my favorite of the cruiserweights. Uh, I hated that Rey Mysterio beat you so many times because I didn't like Rey because Rey was <laughs> always beating me. He was always yeah. beating Psychosis. And, like those were my two favorites of the cruiserweights. You know, I don't know if it was just, you know, I, you know, guys with, with long black hair were more my thing, but um, I always liked Hoobie and Psychosis and La Parca and uh, didn't like Ray that much, but absolutely just, you know, fell in love with Ray's work in, in WWE when he was on SmackDown, when he was world champion, he, he, his, his work in WWE, how he could work with guys so much bigger than him. Uh, I more enjoyed watching him wrestle big guys than watching him wrestle cruiserweights. But uh, yeah, getting to work with Ray was, uh, was an awesome experience. Uh, although I even said to Hoopy, I'm like, I got to work with Ray, but me working with you uh, in front of a much smaller <laughs> crowd is a bigger deal because I was actually yeah. a big fan of yours all the time. Oh, um, but but Jeremy, the clock is ticking because I think we will go to part two in a little bit of a moment. So that's why I sent you uh, two invitations just to be sure that we had enough time because sure. I had a I had a feeling this could not keep within uh, 40 minutes. So, but. One thing, I have a, a question for you in yes. part two. So I think actually we will uh, cut this now, give you a little bit of break if you have to. I know probably one thing that comes to my mind before we will go to part two, Jeremy, you're, you're talking about your indestructible. I think you should probably consider being the Wolverine of professional wrestling. <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think Brian Cage and I will have to fight it out again to uh, see who the real Wolverine is of professional yeah. wrestling. And I'm Can and I'm Canadian, so I got an advantage on him. So if he he wants to step in the ring with me again, I'll be I'll be happy to whoop his tail one yeah. more time. <laughs> Just like the last time, Brian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he will for sure. He's actually I, under. I, I did the first time. Yeah, yeah. He's underused at the moment. So, <laughs> but Jeremy, thank you for part one. We'll switch to part two in just a minute. So uh, see you in a bit. Jeremy, just before the break, we were talking a little bit about your career and your long list of whooping asses in the wrestling yeah. world. But um, let's get back. We were talking about Rey Mysterio and some of the key points in your career. But let's pick up from after the Rey Mysterio match. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, uh, that was a great match. I won the IWS World Championship. It was a four-way with Rey Mysterio, Jack Evans, and Speedball Mike Bailey, who oh. has been a, a friend and an enemy. Um, <laughs> but, but, but more often, I'm only an enemy in the ring because uh, he's someone who has helped me out tremendously. We, we came up together, um, you know, in 2005 when I really started working every yeah. as much as I could. He started around the same time as well. And we always had a great friendship, a great bond. And, and as he likes to put it, and I agree with him, um, we may be different in a lot of ways. Uh, I think we are different in a lot of ways, actually. But where we agree, where we meet, is our view on professional wrestling and on what good wrestling is. Mm -hmm. And I think in seeing us perform, there's a lot of similarities in, in what we do and in, in how our matches play out. Um, and and I, admittedly, I've learned a lot from him, and I think he's learned a lot from me, and I think that our friendship is something that has helped both of us be able to be the best versions of ourselves. So I, I can't say enough good about Mike Bailey. And one of the things that always blows my mind is that we had been on so many shows together before promoters finally decided to put us in the ring together. I mean, we had been on <laughs> numerous road trips together oh. and had not even had a one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, we had, it probably wasn't until, I'd say... Uh, It took about three years for us to finally have our first one-on-one, -on -one, maybe even four years. And since then, we haven't had that many, but every time we have, it's been spectacular. You don't believe me, you can go on YouTube, look for a Speedball Mike Bailey versus Jeremy Prophet, and it's always something uh, immaculate in this great art form that we do known as professional wrestling. Oh, that, I will I will laugh for sure. But, but let's go on from Ray Mysterious. So tell us a little bit about more of your matches, key matches, one could say. Yeah, well, I mean, if, if you want to talk even recently, I had the chance to uh, perform here in a main event in Montreal against Trey Miguel, who, uh, oh. you know, 
yeah, he was the X Division champion and uh, got to go in there. I enjoy testing my skills against uh, these big names, against these so-called uh, indie darlings, against guys who have a lot of hype behind them. Because yeah. you know, I like I like to see. It's like okay, you have the hype machine behind you, you have the bright lights and the big stage, but it, it doesn't mean you're better than me. No. You know, when you get in there, when you get in there with Jeremy Prop, I'm going to test your metal. I'm going to make sure that people see. Okay, wow, we know who this guy is, but but where's this guy been all this time? How can someone with these kind of phenomenal skills have, have gone under the radar so long? Hell, the story of my life. You know, yeah. I'm not someone who made a lot of noise. I'm not someone who's a politician. I'm not someone going out for drinks with the guys. I'm someone who just put in the work and who lives, breathes, eats, and sleeps this business of professional wrestling 24 hours a day. My first thought when I wake up is not, um, you know, I can't wait to uh, party or I can't wait to <laughs> do this thing. I, I don't have family. I don't have kids. I don't have those kinds of responsibilities. And that's by choice. I don't want those kinds of responsibilities because my responsibility is professional wrestling. Oh. And so I'm always just thinking of ways to better myself, better myself as a performer, better my body, better what I look like, better the way I speak. Um, to be as dynamic as possible, to be able to overcome any hurdle that's put in front of me. Uh, so yeah, I like I like getting to sink my teeth into the you know people like Trey Miguel, um, <laughs> people who've been doing this quite frankly half as long as me and are perceived to be better than me. Not no disrespect to the guy, but you know I, I just like changing people's perceptions. That uh, I, I'm like a fine wine. I've gotten better and better through all the years that I've done this. And you know we're in a generation now where there are people who do this for maybe seven, eight years, and people are like, okay, they're really good, they're great, they're, okay, but I've been doing professional wrestling, I've been doing this form of, of martial art for 16 years, I've been doing yeah. this since I was, I was a minor, so that's why my skills are so refined in every aspect of it, and I've never turned away from any aspect, I think a lot of people get complacent, they, they say, oh, well, I'm very good at doing this one thing, I'm a great athlete, I'm a great acrobat, <laughs> um, I cut a great promo, I'm, I'm a, a big steroid monkey that, you know, looks like uh, they, they have uh, some kind of a, like they've been exposed to gamma rays or something yeah. and they don't have to learn any other aspect of professional wrestling because you slap that on a poster and people are going to be like, oh, wow, this is like some kind of a freak show we're going to, you know, you know what? These people content themselves on just being good at one aspect and they never evolve. They never improve. I've never been like that. I've said, I want to be the best at everything. Um, you know, I, I want to be like the, like the Shang Tsung of, uh, professional <laughs> wrestling. You know, he can turn into anybody, do anything that they do just as well as they do it. That's, that, that's my idea. And, you know, being that I am kind of immortal and have lasted this long and, uh, never gotten an injury, uh, maybe I'm just some freak of nature or maybe, you know, I, I'm meant to do this and that's my calling. And that's why God put me on this earth. Oh, Jeremy, I think in the way there that when you describe yourself there, I think you're a little bit modest. But uh, but um, actually, if I should say it, actually, you're you're just that good. It's pure. Yeah. You're just that good. But one one wrestler, I would like to test your your knowledge, or maybe if you have ever wrestled him. One of my favorite guys in professional wrestling, and now is um, the phenomenon. One, someone could say Kenny Omega. Hmm. So, what's your thoughts on him? Well, I'll, I'll just say it like this: like I say to everybody else, I see the similarities, and believe me, that's why they call Kenny Omega the White Jeremy Prophet. Yeah, that's what it comes down to. Ah, yeah, yeah. I always, I when I see uh, Kenny Omega in the ring, sometimes I feel like if I take my uh, joystick or something like that, it's like moving a, a computer character around the ring, this like of mechanical uh, way of uh, moving around. But but Jeremy, we should not talk about, we should actually talk about the most important thing in this interview, you. So let's take us back again, because Rey Mysterio, Trey Miguel, What's what's also in there? I mean, there's so many, there's so many to yeah. name. And it's yeah. not just, you know, guys like that who are great athletes like Mysterio and Miguel, and I mentioned moving to Guerrera. There, yeah. There's also people like um, you know, uh, Hacksaw Jim Duggan that I've wrestled, Brutus the Barber Beefcake. Uh, oh, oh him wrestled the genius Lanny Poffo. Uh, oh. some people say he doesn't like me, but I, I still like him um <laughs> multiple times. Um, you know, I've wrestled Coco Beware. There's a 
famous shoot interview you can see on Hannibal TV about Coco Beware, who I've been very mean to uh, over the last <laughs> couple of years and have you know, recently got over it. Um, I, I've wrestled a lot of these uh, legends, a lot of these people who have a wealth of knowledge and gotten to pick their brains. And I'm a firm believer, and this is the advice that I tell people, is that there's stuff that works for, for them that may not work for you. But it doesn't mean that you have to dismiss all the knowledge that comes from a bygone generation. No. So I've taken elements of all these people, any veteran I can get close to, and again, sink my fangs into and be able to absorb and assimilate their knowledge and add it to my game. I'm always trying to add pieces to the puzzle. I'm trying to be the most complete wrestler in existence. And if these people made money in the business, then there's definitely something I can learn from them, even if they're maybe past their physical prime. Um, you know, I, I worked with Scott Steiner oh, three times yeah. when big. he was still Big Papa Pump. You know? Oh, and, and yes. I, I earned his respect through doing those three matches with him, uh, mm. going toe to toe with him. No fear. Fear is not part of my game. I'm just, you know, I go in there and I know it's, it's my time to shine. I don't let anybody impose themselves on me. And not to say that that was the case with Scott Steiner, but I knew that like <laughs> I had to go in there and I had to show the people, OK, he may be bigger than me, but let's face it. I'm the danger. I'm the danger when you're in there. I'm not here to fool around. I'm not here to be upstage or outclassed by anybody. I have a lot of pride in what I do. I put in the work and I'm not going to be a second class citizen in that ring and, and definitely not in any aspect of my life. So, you know, learned a lot from working with Steiner. Um, you know, I, I, again, I could go on and on. I've worked with uh, Jay Lethal, uh, had, had a tremendous match with, with him in, in my hometown. Oh, he's um, impressive. I like that oh, guy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, definitely uh, more than meets the eye because, yeah, he was one of the hardest hitters. And I'm the kind of guy when we're doing an exchange of like forearms or chops or that kind of I'm, there's no quit in me. And lethal <laughs> lethal, you know, he brought the fight just as much. Uh, you know, I came out victorious in that match. Uh, you know, thank you, Jay. But um, he definitely brought the fight. And I think that uh, it went a long way to helping to further advance me in my career, you know, seeing that there are people at that level and um, you know, being able to learn. And uh, I will say, I think that uh, it was a learning experience for both of us, but it was one hell of a fight and the fans went home happy. Um, you know, I got to work with Sanjay Dutt on, on two occasions also. Oh. I know he comes to mind because him and Lethal are doing their thing in AEW. Um, and again, it, it's eclectic the amount of people I've worked with that have achieved fame and acclaim. Um, worked with, uh, to this day, we're still good friends, uh, Mark Quinn of Private Party when he was just starting out, he might've even been in his, his rookie year or his second year of professional wrestling. We had a rivalry uh, in Maine and oh. uh, it was the battle of the four fifties at the time. And then we had a <laughs> fight and, you know, Mark is, um, you know, still to this day, we talk uh, pretty often, uh, but that was when he was just starting out. You know, I'm really glad to see that he got great opportunities that came his way with AEW doing really well with Isaiah Cassidy. We got the chance to reconnect on a show here in Montreal for IWS. Um, just, just again oh. before COVID and uh, it was cool. It was like no time had passed, even though it had been probably a good three, four years since we've seen each other. It was like no time had passed and we've been, we've been connected. We've been good friends ever since. Um, yeah. And I, I, I've seen tons of these people, tons of people who've, who've gone on to great success, uh, legends that I've faced. Uh, I'm just trying to think of, of more. It was always some that I forget. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I wrestled uh, beer money, you know, James Storm oh, and yeah. Bobby Roode. Uh, you know, I faced uh, that's a lot of big names. Just it, it's I like that because you're getting sure value if you're a promoter putting me up against these guys. Because I'm I'm going to make sure that they don't take a night off. I'm going to make sure they're not lazy, <laughs> yeah. and I'm going to make sure that uh, they they see okay, wow, like this this is not someone like somebody that we see on all the independent shows where they they kind of have limited skills and they're intimidated by us. And they don't want to do anything. Uh, no, I I, I want to get the most out of them. I want to you know, make sure that the, the juice is worth the squeeze. And I'm always going to squeeze whether there's juice or not. Um, <laughs> exactly. I worked, uh, I worked with Carlito. Uh, on oh, he's three, great. Three, three occasions. Carlito and I worked together. Um, great guy in and out of the ring. Uh, last time we worked again, we sp I've spent much time with him outside of the ring too. And uh, he was a guy I always enjoyed what he did on TV. Uh, met him a few times when he was in WWE, then got to work with him. Uh, He's just a true pro with me, real nice guy. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I could go on and on with all the big names I, I've worked with. Uh, there, there's so many. I worked with Eugene uh, three times, Nick Densmore. Oh, uh, yeah. 
here's a little secret. Like a lot of the, the people you see on my podcast, a, lo- a lot of times it's me reaching out to uh, my podcast, Jofo in the Ring, which yeah. you can find, by the way, you can follow on Twitter at Jofo in the Ring. That's J-O-F-O uh, on all social media platforms. Got to get the cheap plug in there. Um, of course. Yeah, a lot of the people on Jofo are people that I've worked with in some capacity. Ah. And uh, they agree to come on because, you know, they're my friends. And, uh, you know, so I so I guess I'm just as much guilty of what the wrestling business does in uh, promoters. You know, <laughs> yeah, uh, right? podcast. I'm, I'm ah, guilty but, of doing that in the podcast business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand that. That's why my my focus is actually finding, not finding all the stars and the that's on TV, but I want to find all the others that's just underneath there because I think as we as you mentioned early on that's where the best wrestlers will be and Absolutely. that's that's where you are but but one thing that's i'm also very interested in is your take on the canadian wrestling scene today yeah i think the canadian wrestling scene is the best it's ever been i think that we could put any scene in the world uh to shame wrestler for wrestler pound for pound male female heavyweight cruiserweight lightweight midget whatever it might be um we have the best the best here in canada um and the reason is, is that we have to you know we don't have the same luxuries as the people in the united states you can watch a famous video online that's just been growing and growing uh called a moment of truth with jeremy prophet which you know anytime i'm on screen it's a moment of truth but this one i talk about that because too many canadians uh feel that oh these people are on tv because they're good it's like no they're not on tv because they're good they're on tv because they're in the right place at the right time That's what the wrestling business has always been about. It's been always yeah. about right place, right time. And so when it comes down to it, I wanted to voice that because people don't realize the struggles that we have to go through. They oh. don't realize that we can't just go wrestle in the United States. Uh, they, they literally think, oh, well, you know, if you're not getting booked in these big name companies and <laughs> GCWs and the PWGs, it, it's because you're not good. Uh, if people only knew the amount of American bookings I had to turn down and the money And the the luxury that goes along with it, the planes, the hotels, all that kind of stuff, it, it would blow their minds because we cannot legally go wrestle in the United States. Even if you, you're going for free, which a lot of people do go for free, uh, probably why they, you know, they they'll get booked because uh, promoters are cheap. But uh, a lot of them do go for free and a lot of them go and work under the table and work illegally. Um, so when it comes to someone like me, you know, if I want to go wrestle let's say in Danbury, Connecticut, then I run the risk of the border stopping me and saying, well, you know, even if you're going for free and we have no proof that you're going for free, but we have no proof of the contrary, your presence there is still taking a job away from an American citizen oh. because by having you in that match, they could have had an American who does this, the job as good as you in the match which is why you need a work visa. People think work visas, people don't understand the concept of work visas because the United States concept of a work visa is far different than a lot of other places in the world. For example, in the UK, you know, neighboring country to where you are. Yeah. The UK, it's one flat fee. I believe it's maybe 250 or 300 pounds. You get your three month work visa. You need just need any promotion to sign on and say, I want this talent from another country to come here and perform. Boom, stamped, sealed, delivered, done. The United States, there's a long waiting list because they have outdated laws that uh, prevent people from Mexico from coming in and doing, uh, you know, menial jobs illegally uh, mm. and undercutting American citizens. That those same laws keep Canadians from being able to come in and perform <laughs> on an equal playing field, even though when it comes down to it, like I always say, I'm like, hey, we're all Americans, all of us from top to bottom. It's called North America. Just yeah. because we're not from the United States portion. <laughs> does not make us any less American than you guys. Why the division? Yeah. Why the tribalism? Why the why the hate? Why the, the imperialist outdated mentality? So anyways, with that said, we can't even go on a voluntary basis without coming under scrutiny. So if you look at it, everyone yeah. who's achieved success, all the Canadians, I don't even have to name names, but look, look at any Canadian on TV. You even, you even named one of those guys before. Um, they achieved it through achieving merits outside of Canada. You know, let's face it, and I'll, I'll put it to the test. I'll even I'll even say it. It's not because of all the great matches Kenny Omega did in Winnipeg, why no. he's now on TV and a former world champion. It's not because of what he did in Canada. It's what he did elsewhere. And you can attribute the same thing 
to anyone who's made it. It's because they made a name for themselves elsewhere. And it's not the way that it should be because we should be allowed to go to the States without scrutiny. Um, we're, we're athletes. So, I mean, if I was a practitioner of uh, judo or, uh, or, or Aikido or, or a sport that's, that's actually uh, you know, competitive, I'm allowed to go and perform in my sport anywhere. I'm allowed to go. I'm allowed to win a trophy, prize money, whatever it might be. But I guess because wrestling is considered entertainment more than sports, you need a work visa. Getting the work visa sometimes takes almost a year, if not more. Um, usually it's, it's a fee of between two to sometimes, you know, 15, $20,000, depending on it. And you have to wait and you have to also justify that you are better than an American citizen by, by definition. And you can watch my, my episode of Jofo where I interview Michael Elgin. He really puts it into, into context really well. Oh, um, that, there I will that for sure. Because I yeah, think it's actually a, quite interesting that it's- You have to prove that you're better. <laughs> Yeah. And in a, in a sport where we know that this sport is entertainment, how do you prove that you're better? I, I, I could show that <laughs> Jeremy Prophet against Speedball Mike Bailey or, you know, Jeremy Prophet against Bobby Lashley and say, hey, you know, here I got one over on, on world champions and whatnot. But it's not that cut and dry. So you have to have proofs. You have to have people writing letters endorsing you. It's, it's such a, an asinine uh, cock and ninny process that, that you have to go through to justify that. If it was just a money thing, hell, I'd have paid it a long time ago. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've done pretty well for myself in life. I, I would throw the five grand at it or whatever. I would, because let's face it, if you want an education, you're paying a lot more than five grand. If you want an Ivy League education, then you're paying a hell of a lot more than that. So I would gladly throw the money at it, knowing that this same gentleman you see here conversing with you could generate millions of dollars in revenue, not only for himself, but for any company out there. So I know I would make that back. That's a drop in the ocean, but it's the other red tape, the other scrutiny, the other rigmarole that you have to go through that makes it so disheartening and difficult for Canadians to be appraised on the same stage and with the same value as an American doing the same job. So that's the struggle we face. And it's why a lot of careers fizzle out. And for the longest time, I felt like I'm the only person who was willing to talk about it. And, and that's simply because I don't care. Like, like, I just don't give a damn. When it comes down to it, you can Tell me to be quiet. You can you can tell me, you can threaten me, you can do all those things. Hey, look, you know, black people have been have been enslaved, have been yeah. have been told to keep their heads down and not complain about things. And what look, I'm gonna keep my head up and I'm gonna speak the truth, whether you like it or not. You got a problem with me? Okay, you can find me. I know how to throw hands. I don't mind. I don't mind conflict. I enjoy conflict. In fact, I enjoy I'm I'm a very confrontational person and I'm an aggressive person. Yeah. So you got a problem with me? You're gonna have to deal with me and pretty soon you'll find out why I'm the problem and I'm the danger. With that said, um, I started talking about this and I think people started realizing, hey, you know what? This is why we're not making it. We're here going around in circles, putting on these great matches, but nobody's looking here because the scouting is not there. All of these companies, WWE, AEW, Impact, they should all be scouting Canada. They should be scouting every country in the world. It's not just Canada. I mean, I live in Canada my whole life, but it's not just here. It's everywhere in the world. You look at professional sports, you know, hockey, baseball, the NFL, the NBA, they look for the best players everywhere in the world. Uh, how do you think that professional baseball found a guy like Veer Mahan, you know, who was a, a track and field, uh, an athletics athlete in India, and they managed to scout that this person could be a great pitcher and brought him into professional baseball. The same thing should apply to wrestling, where they're able to scout wrestlers everywhere, or even people who aren't wrestlers, but, but scout and look for that talent and bring them in and fast track them and not make them not make great talent go to waste. Um, I mean, I, I should have been on TV years ago. I think there's a lot of great damage I could have done. And it's just the case of being born in Montreal, Quebec, instead of being born in, you know, Albuquerque, New Mexico, or, or Honolulu, Hawaii, or, uh, you know, uh, yeah. Coconut Creek, Florida. But, but I think that should actually be a very interesting point. And I would love to give you all the time you need to talk about it because I think that's probably the backside of professional wrestling. That's there's politics actually preventing the best wrestler in the world, Jeremy Prophet, from competing at the highest level. So, but but Jeremy, Jeremy, I think it's actually for me, it's a sad thing to hear that the system is so 
old and rigorous and not really flexible to fit into also this kind of entertainment or sports so that you could all the talents that you also are talking about in Canada could go and perform in the States. It'd be the place to be. I mean, I'd be there. I'd be there every, every, as much as I could. I, I, I would, if it were that easy, I really would because there's more exposure over there. There's more people, there's more opportunities to rub shoulders with decision makers in the wrestling business. And that's how people get places. And it's always the same story with, with Jeremy Prophet. Anytime, that I've been seen by any of these decision makers and whatnot, they all have this moment of how is someone like this passed under the radar? They all have the same moment. You know, I was working a show here in Montreal for a company called TOW, Top of the World Wrestling, and I crossed paths with Mike Bucci, that's uh, Simon Dean or uh, Nova from ECW, who had just finished working with WWE as one of their talent scouts, and he saw me and he stopped dead in his tracks. Now, he doesn't even know if I'm a wrestler. I'm just there looking the way I look. And he says, oh, wow, you know, you uh, you have a great look. Are you a wrestler? And I said, well, yeah. And he said, OK, I, I got to get your information. I got to send it over to WWE. Now, the thing is, this is in Canada. And this was this kind of an aha moment. And I've had those moments everywhere. I had I, my first tryouts with uh, WWE when I went down to FCW. They, they absolutely loved me. They were all taken aback. My first tryouts with TNA, which was in uh, 2011. Uh, you know, Jeff Jarrett, D'Lo Brown, all of them really taken aback by me. How is how is there a talent this amazing that has gone unnoticed? How have we not heard about him on the independence? The, the, the thing is, a lot of these people, not specifically those people, but people who scour the independence, uh, unfortunately, don't look further than their nose because they only look at the big name companies. And that's it. Not knowing that there are lots of great talents who aren't there. And I've always wanted to be that. I've always wanted to be a talent where people can see me and say, wow, here's someone who didn't work for those big companies, but is just as good, if not better than anybody there. And I believe in my abilities. I work damn hard day in, day out to fine tune everything that I do. I've got a massive chip on my shoulder, but that's because I constantly sit back and see people doing a job that I can do infinitely better. And like I said, if I'm lying, I'm dying. I know what I bring to the table. I don't have to be humble. I don't have to hold my head down like I've been enslaved for years. And uh, no, I, I can actually speak the truth because I can deliver on everything I say. And it's just that matter of fact. You give me the opportunity, which I know opportunity is coming. You give me that opportunity, I will succeed because it's what I've worked for. And when you work hard for something, you can be on autopilot when that opportunity comes. I've been ready for that yesterday. No need to hustle. No need to sprint to the finish line. I'm ready to go and I'm ready to win that race, hands down. Put me up against anybody in the world, you'll see what I deliver. You, you get me, in, you have the same interview and sit me in front of a Vince McMahon, sit me in front of a Tony Khan, I guarantee I'm walking out with a contract because I'm the real deal. I deliver on everything I say. And seriously, who wouldn't want this on their TV every week? Yeah. Yeah, who doesn't? But, but if you could pick a promotion, uh, and every, the talk is uh, always about... WWE, AEW, but there's so much more there just underneath those two. If you could pick any promotion and pick any wrestler, who and where? Um, it's an easy question. Uh, I would love, I, would, I am surprised I didn't get this opportunity with all the people that I named and came close a few times. But I would love to wrestle. Uh, actually, I'm going to backtrack on that. There was a name I was going to say. <laughs> I am going to backtrack. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, no, I, I speak the truth. Look, yeah, people, yeah. I'm not, I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. I might be 99%, but there's still going to be that 0.1% of the time that uh, things might not go according to plan. Um, <laughs> the person I would like to wrestle, and I'm a firm believer it's going to happen, because there's just too many coincidences for this to not happen and be the perfect uh, ending to a chapter in my story. That person would be, it would be an AEW and it would be with Chris Jericho. Oh, yes. It just makes too much sense. You know, I met him when I was younger. He gave me, like I met him right when I started training. He gave me the, the best um, advice of, of anyone. You know, I, I was fortunate. I had the chance. I was working for a newspaper. Uh, I'm a journalist. That's what my education is in. And I got to interview him before Fozzy concert. And uh. he invited me backstage. And I presented him with a copy of the article. 
and he gave me advice and he said, you know, this is not going to be easy. It's going to be the hardest thing you do in life. But if you dedicate yourself to it, if you never stop working, you know, you're going to make it. He said, look at me. I made it. You can make it too. And, and that's what I say to myself. I see people, you know, stumbling their way through matches on TV. And I'm like, you know what, if this, if this, if this jabroni can, can be there, I can be there. There's a place for me. You know, you don't got to be better than the best person of which I think I'm in the top percentile in the world. Um, you just got to be better than the worst person because why the heck should he have a job and not you? You know, so that's how I see it. There's a lot of people that if I come into existence, they 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 fall down the pecking order. And, <laughs> yeah. and I say I say I come into existence, they they don't exist anymore because who cares about these people when you see people who look like me and talk like me and do all the things I do? Who cares about whoever your favorite wrestler used to be? With that said, um, you know, Jericho instilled that work ethic in me. Um, and then you know, when I had my trials with WWE, he and I spoke again. I got to tell him again how those words always stuck with me. And, you know, he was someone who was there, gave me good advice, went to bat for me, gave me the Jericho Award in, in, yeah. in 2021. So, you know, there's always been these connections. You know, he did this one speech uh, not that long ago for the Jericho Appreciation Society, uh, where he said all these, you know, indie wrestlers, other people saying they want to be a part of it. And, you know, and I agree with him. And I think that <laughs> I personally, I think I personally would be a great fit because let's face it, you know, the sports entertainer, the wizard himself acknowledged me. So I think I got the golden ticket when it comes down to it. I think I'd be a great fit in that group. Um, yeah, so, you could. Sh you should actually take the place of Jay Kaga. Uh, I, I, I could. I could take the place of any and all of them. You know, it yeah. could just be me and Chris. I'd be able to hype him up, and he and I, even as a team, <laughs> we could run roughshod over those companies. You know, we could squash the Bucks, though those FTR, uh, any of them. Uh, you know, whoever yeah. else, the Butcher and the Blade, my my buddy Quinn there, who I've already. I, beat his little ass uh, many, many times. So, you know, we, we could run roughshod over that whole company. I could bring a whole new dynamic to, to that group. And, you know, the Jericho Appreciation Society, but the man himself chose to appreciate me, which I appreciate and have appreciated him and his work. So I think that whether we're a team or whether that one-on-one -on -one happens, you know, us as opponents, I think it's a good matchup. It's a good juxtaposition. Uh, I think Jericho has been a, a huge inspiration on me from the start of my career. Um, You know, the similarities, there's just so many. We're about the same size. We both can get it done on a mic, in the ring. Uh, I've never been injured. He's barely been injured. You know, we both got, you know, beautiful, nice manes of hair. Uh, hopefully he still has his after that match with uh, Ortiz coming up Ooh, this week. Yeah. Uh, don't know when this episode is coming out. So that comment might be a little bit dated. But, you know, I don't think the world is ready for a bald Chris Jericho. Uh, but again, yeah, the similarities are numerous. And I think that uh, when it comes down to it, We're, we're kind of similar people and have similar approaches to wrestling. So I think it, it'd be a perfect fit. So that's the match that I would like most. Uh, where I was going was uh, another match that I'd wanted for a while, strictly from a wrestling standpoint, because I get a lot of comparisons to him. Uh, but the match I would want would be also a WWE with AJ Styles. Now oh. I know AJ, you know, might be a little past his prime, uh, a little long in the tooth, as they say. Um, but definitely he's someone that, again, I feel just matches up really well with me around the same size, same kind of athletic ability. I see AJ do things that kind of looks like when I do things. Um, although I think that if he and I were to have a match as competitive as it would be in the ring, uh, I think it would be a, a, a one-sided drubbing on, on the mic in favor of your boy. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, for sure that, because that's not why AJ, you will, uh, probably he will have that. 0.01% chance of uh, <laughs> of uh, when if you had to battle him on the mic. So, I, I, but I've, I've met AJ a couple of times, and he was always an absolute gentleman with me. Um, you know, and he, he seems like a very good human being and, and a fantastic wrestler. Uh, it, it really bothers me that a lot of times we were on the same shows, and promoters wouldn't pair us up. So um, I feel like that's kind of one that got away. And uh, hopefully both those matches can happen. I don't know how it would happen, but I'm a believer that anything is possible. So, you know, I'm a man without borders. I don't let a border stop. I'm the man without borders. So yeah. I feel anytime, any place, anywhere, anyone wants a fight. I've never backed down from a fight in my life. In the ring, out of the ring, never said no to a match. And uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, fought, I've fought all kinds of people. I've fought some of the, the, the worst killers in this business. You know, the Scott Steiners, the Brian Cages, uh, yeah. Hannibal. 
you know, a guy who's been blackballed for, uh, you know, allegedly trying to kill somebody in there. I fought him 15 <laughs> times, 15 times, and I still look this good, yeah. you know, because I take the fight to whoever's put in front of me. Don't judge the book by its cover. There is so much more fight in this dog. <laughs> you know, they say it's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. Uh, I don't even see it like that. I see it that I'm a fire breathing dragon when I step in there. So you can put the most vicious dog in front of me. I'm going to rip it apart, burn it to the ground, scorch the earth and make it want to rethink its choices in life. Yeah. Yeah. We are for sure. No problem. I think you will do that for sure, Jeremy, but I think this episode, the, the never ending Jeremy profit promo. Yeah. 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 But, but I love it. Actually. That's why I actually, I did. Now I can uh, lift and tell you a little bit that I actually did a little bit of uh, investigation before uh, because I wanted to find the, the special wrestlers, the unique ones. And that's actually, this interview could probably go on for two or three hours more. But, but Jeremy, everything must end for now, I think. And I must say, I will give you some last words to do some promotion for your podcast, your Twitter profile and so on, because I want people to know where to find you and where to, to enjoy your matches. Well, I'll try not to be too long winded about this. Um, okay. but yeah, you can, you can follow me if you want to continue to hear or read the greatness that I provide the audience with. You can follow me on Twitter at Jeremy Prophet, J E R E M Y P R O P H E T. And you can follow me on Instagram at The Real Jeremy Prophet. Uh, I'm also on Facebook. Just search for Jeremy Prophet. You can find my page on there real easy. And you can see me on Jofo in the Ring. That's J O F O in the Ring. You can follow us on Twitter. You can follow us on every social media platform. And most importantly of all, on YouTube, where we have episodes where we review past pay-per-views, where we speak to up-and-coming talent, where we speak to legends of the wrestling business. And you get to hear me do what I do here um, <laughs> over and over on each episode. Hopefully entertaining you. I know I'm not everybody's cup of tea. I'm a very abrasive, aggressive person, and uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. I don't compromise myself for anyone. But uh, you can definitely hear me on there doing my thing week in, week out, and giving you people entertainment, which is why you watch this. So we want to provide you with what you expect. We want to make sure you get your money's worth, even though all of our content is free. Um, also, <laughs> one thing I'm, I want to really touch on is another thing yeah. that I'm a part of right now. It's called Wrestling Academy. So you can oh. actually go on wrestling-academy.ca and it's a competition being put on by Jacques Rougeau taking wrestlers from all over Canada. And at the end, there's going to be three male winners, one female winner, and it goes by votes. So 60% of the vote is you folks, the people, voting for who their favorite is. And then 40% are the judges who are there. Episode one is already up on jacquesrougeau.ca. If you go on to wrestling-academy.ca, you can find the link to YouTube. Go on there. And obviously, I want you guys to vote for me. But I don't even have to say, go on and vote for me. I'm not desperate. Go on and watch the show. Having seen the guy who sat here and entertained you for this two-part episode. Go on and watch the show and realistically think about, should you vote for anybody other than me? Watch my performance. Watch what I do. And then make that decision. Objectively speaking, you'll see. Nobody on there is in my league. Nobody even comes close. You're going to see uh, you know, out of shape people in t-shirts. You're going to see people trip over their words when they put a microphone in front of them. You're going to see people you know, not know what they're doing when they're in the ring. Uh, and then you're going to see one person who realistically should be the first black Canadian world champion that should have been provided with a bigger stage and brighter spotlights a hell of a long time ago. Go on and watch it. I don't have to say anything about it. I don't have to sell myself. My body of work speaks for itself. Just go on and watch it. And if I'm lying with anything that I'm saying, if anything is inaccurate, you don't have to vote for me. But believe me, you'll go on there. You'll see it. You will want to vote for me. I mean, unless you're a card-carrying member of the Ku Klux Klan, I don't see why you wouldn't want to vote for me. After that, after that <laughs> but go on there, watch it, yeah. and then toss a vote to your wrestler. Because the winners get $5,000. Not that I care about the money, but the winners also get three months at the Nightmare Factory. Oh. With Hugh Marshall, with Cody, with Glacier. Three months. Three months for me to go there and show them 
that I'm the best thing they're going to see. That that realistically, if they have a student there that's as good as me, uh, then my question would be, why is he not world champion in AEW? Because that's the level that I perform at. So it's just about going there, getting that opportunity, getting to cross that border into, into the States and getting ready to show what you guys hopefully know by now, which my fans already know and anyone that comes into my orbit knows that I should be in a much better place on TV, changing this business, changing the game. So go on there, throw me a vote. That's the mission that we're on right now. And we're going to get there. I do not plan on letting any of you guys down to support me. Okay. Jeremy Prophet, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure.